the end of the Second World War, no more need for fighters. For the plane makers of the West, the hope of a new golden age of aviation. On the 7th of October, 1947, the huge new assembly hall at Filton was the setting for an historic occasion. At Bristol, we get a first glimpse of the Brabazon transport plane. The 126-ton airliner is transferred for completion to a newly built hangar. More than four million pounds worth of material has gone into giving Britain the world's biggest airplane. The 143-foot-long passenger compartment can seat 100 people who will fly the Atlantic in 12 hours. Bristol's Lord Mayor was there to see Air Marshal Corriton name the Brabson. The giant plane is due to fly from London to New York in nine months' time. It'll be a triumph for British aviation. Gloucester cricketer Tom Goddard, another celebrity of the day, called in when the local newsreel was making a progress report. Rapidly approaching completion at Filtar is this prototype of the mammoth Brabazon airliner. It is seen here in its huge hangar, specially built to accommodate the vast wingspan, the 50-foot high tail. Whilst having a look around this giant of the air, West Country Gazette's cameraman came across a giant of sport, Tom Goddard. He had come along together with members of the Gloucestershire County Cricket Team at the invitation of BAC. But this was the occasion of Tom Goddard's benefit. Long Tom soon found his way to the pilot's cockpit, where he seemed quite at home. The mighty power units are now being fitted to the airliner, which, say BAC officials, is due to make its first flight before the end of the year. We take this opportunity of wishing Tom Goddard and the Gloucestershire County Cricket Team Good luck in the present season, and wish those whose energy and enthusiasm has gone to build the Brabazon continued success in their efforts. Off-spin bowler Long Tom would go on to retire with nearly 3,000 wickets. And the Brabazon? Hopes were high at Filton in 1948. More than 7,000 aircraft workers had witnessed the naming, and none who had come in contact with the new giant would ever forget those days. Mr. Ben Benton, Chief Production Engineer, 42 years at Filton. Well, I think it's most exciting because we've been so used to building air wall planes. This is something brand new, you know, and uh, our thoughts for the future are entirely on this huge aircraft. Mr. Jack Gregory, Manager General Services, 45 years at Filton. Well, I uh, have flown in the modern jumbo jet and I like that very much. And I think uh, Brabazon 20 years ago would have been similar. It was so vast in those days, it was something to be seen, you know. And for sheer size, the Brabazon, even unfinished, would still be a sight to see today. Its wingspan of 230 feet was nearly 40 feet more than a jumbo jet. But its speed was only half, nearer 300 miles an hour compared with a jumbo six. Maximum passenger capacity was to be 200, not five, though in great comfort. Now, after four years' work, the Brabazon was about ready to fly. There was a tremendous amount of excitement. You're waiting for the day to come along, and it couldn't come too fast for everybody, you know. But um, I reckon the whole of Bristol was out here to see the thing fly. I agree with what Benton says. It's a very exciting business, first takeoff and first landing, yes. We had scores of visitors all the time, continuous. And they come along here and they see the Brabazon in the center bay there. The aircraft they saw had started out in 1942 as an idea for a 100-ton bomber. Now in 1949, it was ending up as a 200-passenger airliner. It's so vast, you know. It was 230 feet wingspan, 199 feet long, and 52 foot over the fin. Tremendous aircraft. Sunday, September the 4th, 1949. A fine, sunny morning. Test pilot Bill Pegg's only worry, could he live up to this great occasion? Certainly, it proved almost overwhelming for the then BBC air correspondent, Charles Gardner. And now, as I sit here in the middle of the runway, the runway which was specially built for the test of this Brabazon, the runway which is 2,750 yards long, I look up and I see this Brabazon, this machine which looks to me like an airship with wings, this long silver cigar with a very big fin. Um, 
is being readied uh, the, uh, for the, the engine start. The uh, starter trolleys have been rushed up to her. The crew have climbed on board. And any moment now, uh, the engines will be starting and she'll be turning down this runway to come uh, uh, fast taxiing down. And it may be the takeoff because only Bill Pegg, the pilot, uh, can say uh, when he is going to pull her clear of the ground. It's just that it depends on how she feels, how he feels, what the dials are reading. And on any one of the runs he makes today, that may be the run. He may suddenly get her nose wheel off and then decide that she feels like flying and pull her the rest of the way. And then away we go and the Brabus and one will be in the air. And that's what everyone is thinking. We're watching every move now because any moment the Brabus and one may be airborne. And now she's moving. Now she's moving, Bill Pegg's piled on all the power onto those eight engines. Faster and faster now, beginning to pick up speed. She's passing alongside me now, quite a noise she's making. And she's going faster and faster, faster and faster. And the nose wheel is off, the nose wheel is off. And I'm looking to see if the main wheels come off as well. The main wheel, she's off, she's off. She's hopped along the ground. The Brabazon is in the air. And she's in the air, she's climbing away. Oh, that was a straight takeoff. He ran oh, uh, less than half the length of the runway. He's got a bit of flap on. And now this enormous aeroplane is in the air. As it passes over Pat Beach at the end of the runway, I hand you to Pat Beach. You must have a superb view of it over to Pat Beach. Absolutely superb. Yes, she's coming only about 300 yards away and just passing me here and she looks as steady as a rock as though she's been flying for thousands and thousands of hours. Majestic great silver cigar going past away to my right out towards Hambrook. Here she comes, he's still uh, over the end of the runway, still about 100 feet up, and he's lowering her down inch by inch almost, almost inch by inch he's lowering her down onto the ground. Here she comes, he's going to touch down about 200 yards up from the end of the runway, he's holding her off, he's holding her off, the main wheels are just off the ground, the ma they're on, they're on, no bounce, the people are cheering, uh, Lord Brabazon has taken his hat off and waving it, and the Brabazon is down and she's completed half an hour of test flight beautifully. that noise of the engine and she's braked and she's braked and she's finished at the point she took off. Then pilot Bill Pegg gave a quiet press conference. Yesterday we as a crew handled it for the first time. It moved under its own power, as I say again, for the first time uh, and behaved uh, really very satisfactorily. Uh, we got up to speeds in the region of uh, 66 knots and managed to get the nose wheel off the ground without anything disastrous or even uncomfortable happening. Now, as a result of those um, trials yesterday, um, we decided that uh, if all the conditions were suitable, uh, we would uh, have a go today. Mr. Benton had been almost as confident. Well, yes, you do. You wonder how the pilots can approach it because you haven't got the feel of it, you know, until he does. But, uh, with the very seasoned pilots, of course, it was a first-class landing. Oh, I'm very proud of it. Very exciting. Um, if you made aeroplanes, you had the opportunity to fly occasionally. And he decided to go down to Lime Bay. So we flew down over there, as steady as a rock, this aircraft was, you know. Mr. Benton describes his own personal test flight in the Bristol Brabazon. I think it's always the same with the first aircraft. You've you run up and down the runway and you've got to be absolutely sure of the weather because although you don't win tunnel tests, you know, everything doesn't respond the same way. So there's lots of trials on the runway before you go, you know. But, but I think we've all got faith in these aeroplanes. That's why, you know, they're very carefully made. Everybody's sort of um, doing the best to make the best product. And they're so proud when it flies in the runway. And then... Uh, and the brave man gets up board and away she goes, you know. And everybody cheers then. <laughs> we 
you can hear the engine drawing up to crescendo, you know, and away she goes. The aircraft sort of rolls along the runway and the wings are rippling along, you know, and then you climb up, steady as a rock. It was one of those flights that you, you dream about. Once you're off the ground, you know, you're quite happy. It is so huge. You didn't think you were in an airplane at, at that time. When you got in the main cabins of the Brabus, and they were tremendous. You know, you felt as though you were walking around in the local village hall. Well, as I saw it, it was a thing that was going to fly London, New York. 200 people in very great comfort. It's a big lounge on board and a bar. and. Um, have films in flight, the sort of thing they do with the Jumbo today. And this was 20, 25 years ago. I think it was a very exciting project. I'm very sorry it didn't go on London, New York. But would noise-conscious New York have let this eight-engine, 20,000 horsepower monster land? I think it is quite a quiet aircraft, as far as concerned. It's certainly not as noisy as the jets, nothing like this. Bristol Brabazon, jumbo of its day, over the cranes of Avonmouth. Test pilot Bill Pegg's destination this afternoon, not quietly to New York. We flew down over Lime Bay, and uh, Bill Pegg, who's the pilot, he had his caravan in the corner of the field. So we decided to go and have a look at it. Then we circled around Bemister, and uh, I think the village thought we were going to land there. But uh, we didn't. We just did one couple of turns and then way back home. A quiet 30-minute flip, and then into land. Turning so vast an aircraft took time. On the first test flight, Bill Pegg had turned over Avonmouth to line up the Filton runway, then speed down to 95 knots and coming into land. You had no sensation at all, just the slightest bump. The particular landing I was on, it was just as smooth as could be. Just sort of glided in, you just felt the the jar, slight jar, when it landed. Otherwise, it was a, a wonderful trip. It's quite fantastic. <laughs> but it's absolutely steady, the aircraft. Enjoyed every minute of flight. But the Brabazon itself hadn't too many enjoyable minutes of flying ahead. Fatigue cracks in the mountings and a limited airframe life combined to kill off the dream flight. London to New York for 200 in spacious luxury. And even if pilots like Pegg could fly such aircraft, could you fill all the seats? Accountants and government said no. It's very sad when you, you know, one of your own products is sort of um, cancelled. And I think the most disastrous thing, and I was in the hangar one day, walking through, and I heard a crash, and that was a wing just being sort of cut off. That was the end of uh, the Brabazon. A seven million pound project ended up as a heap of scrap, knocked down for just 10,000 pounds. The plane's potential noted, but not fully understood. We had everybody in the world come to see that plane. I think it was a forerunner of what had to come eventually. But in the Far East, the present had its problems. A state of emergency had been declared in Malaya. Bristol bowfighters left over from the last war were pressed back into service to try and keep the peace. In the forests below, almost impregnable to the fixed-wing fighters, the helicopter began to develop a new role. Dragonflies and whirlwinds from Westlands with Belvedere's from Bristol became specialists in jungle warfare. In Korea, in 1950, there was a bitter winter war. 
Here, Gloucester meteors, which had first been built in 1944 to save England from defeat, were being armed up again, and so gained the sad distinction of being the first jet fighter to take part in two wars. At altitude, the meteors were outperformed by the American sabers and the Russian MiGs, and this was where most of the fighter-to-fighter -fighter duels were taking place. But lower down, the bomber squadrons needed guarding, and meteors flew escort. American super fortresses launched a round-the-clock bombing offensive, protected by their umbrella of meteors. Meteors also exploited their power-to-weight ratio at low level and became formidable ground strafers. At Fulton, a design which had begun back in 1927 was being developed for more peaceful purposes. The original Bristol Bagshot had become the Bombay Troop Transport of World War II, and the Bombay, in its turn, now led to the freighter, an aircraft that could carry a three-ton truck should find plenty of work for itself and would provide jobs for the plane makers. It gave heart to the people because this is a new line building up. We had great hopes for it. As a matter of fact, some of the planes are still flying in the world now. It was made cheaply and robustly a workhorse to go anywhere in the world, which it did. I believe the Straits Ferry Express between North and South Island and New Zealand are still going. That's an awful long time ago. Nearer home, the Channel Air Bridge was soon operating smoothly. Outward bound with beef, homeward bound with tulips from Rotterdam. The tramps of the air were in increasing demand. It was very fascinating because we started off making orders for fives, and then finally we had an order from Pakistan that made 40. The factory then started to look a bit like it did during the war, with rows of components and things going along. The vehicle ferry service was expanding too. We did some stunts of driving a lorry inside and um, shut the doors and fly away. So I had a lorry driver that had quite a few flying hours. But once again, Bristol's were dreaming another dream. Its name? Britannia. Britannia, yeah. oh yes, yes, that was the big one. Oh yes, I'm saying they had great hopes for it. Much as Brevison, it was an airliner, we were very um, keen to see British Airlines put into operation, and as you know it did, and uh, flew very successfully. In November 1953, the Duke of Edinburgh visited Fulton to see the dream taking shape. It's a totally different construction. The first time an airplane was made with panels, with stringers on, you fitted all the panels together and built the aircraft on that side. The Americans are very interested in our method of building, quite frankly. There were to be a lot of arguments over the Britannia's final power, capacity, speed and range. The basic idea was for an MRE, Medium Range Empire Airliner. Its specifications were finally pushed towards a 350 mile an hour aircraft, passenger capacity 100 seats plus. At Fulton in 1953, Britannia prospects looked good. The first prototype flew in August 1952. Every aspect of its performance minutely noted and recorded. The results were good. 120 flying hours successfully completed. Qantas decided to buy six. Emergency drill proved satisfactory when one engine was cut. In December 1953, the second prototype flew. Six weeks later, on the 4th of February, Brabazon test pilot Bill Pegg took off on a routine flight with some top management and foreign sales representatives on board. 
Flying above the cloud, he noted, everything looked set for a nice, quiet, comfortable flight. The Britannia was down on the mud at the Severn. We knew roughly where it was and um, got all our gear and crew together and raced out there with lorries, mobile cranes and all this sort of thing, which was our normal drill. But of course, everything we dealt with before had been on dry land. We get out there and find it on Severn mud, which was a new thing altogether. Bill Pegg had executed a brilliant crash landing without a single injury. One propeller had torn off as he skated across the mud in a wheels-up landing, though it was not a prop, but an engine failure that had caused the disaster. Fifteen minutes earlier, an engine had exploded and started a major fire. Pegg had limped home, heading for Filton, but praying the tide would be out in case he had to come down earlier in the mud. As the remaining engines started cutting out, he'd made a perfect mud landing. He'd saved the people, now, it was up to others to save the plane. Jack Gregory. The first thing we did was to lay a track on the mud. We used this uh, PSP, which is per pierced steel plating, which the RAF used to use in North Africa and uh, Normandy for making an emergency runway for Spitfires to lay on. We lay this thing and lock it in. And we laid a track to the aircraft on top of the mud. Otherwise, people would have been uh, up to their knees in mud to get to the wreck. The tide was right out, and we knew the tide would be in in so many hours. And uh, we had to try and pull it ashore. And permission was obtained very quickly to get the use of some army tanks. And they were brought out on tank transporters and anchored down on the foreshore and tried to pull it ashore, but it was quite hopeless. The, the suction on Severn mud was unbelievable. The disaster was discussed among the plane makers back at Fulton. Well, I think it's the sort of thing that happens to industry, you know, generally. The accidents happen. There's a lot of gloom and despondency around at the time. But um, I think it's the very time when people really sort of put their backs against a wall and do something about it. I had an emergency crew uh, with all the know-how and all the equipment that could go out very quickly. And my chaps knew exactly what to do and what not to do, which is very important. People salvaged things from the aircraft and instruments and things like this and were able to walk to the shore with whatever they could uh, bring back. Uh, uh, the rest of it was embedded in sarin mud. And of course, once the tide had got into the fuselage, th that was it. In the end, we had to get some flotation bags and uh, use the strength of the tide to bring it up off the mud of the Severn. Uh, once you got some buoyancy into it, you could then get the cables on and, uh, and pull it ashore. And that's how it's done in the end. Of course, it was February, there was ice and snow, and the light went very early, so... Uh, we had to organize flood lighting, otherwise um, people couldn't see what they were doing. That meant you had to organize electricity for the flood lighting, and so it went on. We had to organize mobile canteens to feed people and give them hot drinks. And uh, it was a very exposed site altogether. morning, and the plane passed salvaging, the demolition men moved in. Detailed examination later would show the disaster had been caused by a turbine overspeeding and disintegrating. Up at Filton, the plane makers reacted in their own way. I think we were more engaged on building more Britannias to make up the ones we lost. It was very sad, but um, it happens to most industries. They have a disaster sometime or other. You know, everybody takes it uh, as a, a disaster, but uh, you go around and sort of th trying to get everybody to sort of really push forward and get an excellent day. 
it's a question of, you know, how soon can we get back flying again? By March of next year, Britannia was not only back and flying, but ready for tropical trials under test pilot Walter Gibb. The newspapers were to proclaim sensational success. New airliner flies to South Africa in a few minutes under 19 hours. But it took more than headlines to sell planes, as the builders and designers knew. You, you hope for the best, but uh, it takes a long time to get a lot of airlines to buy the, the planes, you know. And you make on spec. Just how risky a business it was, was emphasized by Britannia's next problems. Major icing troubles resulting in engine flameouts followed the great triumph to Joburg. Another vital year had passed before the Britannia flew to try to take America by storm. In New York, the welcome was there, but were the orders? Well, I think you're always full of confidence when you get a sales tour, you know. But uh, remember, around ran about that time, there's tremendous competition going on with American aircraft, and you're fighting them all the while. On the North American tour, Britannia waged a non-stop sales battle. 32 demonstration flights, 78 hours flying time in 19 days. With Bristol reliability, the Britannia covered 19,000 miles at 340 miles an hour, with just three hours lost in delays. If this still didn't convince foreign airlines, loyalty among the plane makers of Filton never wavered. I like Britannia very much. I did quite a lot of flying in it. I went to America and... I thought it was a beautiful aircraft. It was one of the quietest, most comfortable aircraft ever flown in. If you remember, it's called the Whispering Giant, and that was a very good description for it. Quiet enough, apart from Christmas, and somehow the Christmas spirit never caught on among foreign airlines. Five vital years had been lost through delays and disasters. The new jets were just around the corner. Only 79 Britannias went into service. But on board, Christmas 1957 was unmarred by fears for the future. In Trafalgar Square, the lights were switched on on the Norwegian Christmas tree, flown over by another Britannia. But the future would bring no tidings of comfort and joy for Filton or for their whispering giant, the Bristol Britannia. They had attained excellence, but once again, economic success had escaped them. But whatever the outlook, it was still Christmas. <laughs>